Hello, and welcome to the Justin Center Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. And just a quick reminder that Justin Center as an organization is supported by donors. Uh, we would ask you to consider contributing, becoming a contributor to this organization, this ministry that we have. You can go to justincenter.org and go to our donate page there. Uh, and with me today, I have uh, two members of the Justin Center Board who are very much a lot a part of a lot of what we do here, including teaching for the Widener Institute and, and other things for us. Uh, so we have Pastor Louis Polzin and Pastor Matthew Fenn on today. Uh, so thanks, guys, for joining us. You're thanks welcome. for having us. We get paid after the program, right? Uh, yeah, of course. With all of the all of the funds that we have, very extensive, as you guys know. Um, so, so the reason we're having this discussion today, and you know, we should probably do more of these roundtable discussions too, because this is a fun thing to do. Um, but the reason we're having this discussion today is to talk about the issue of online communion, which is something that a lot of people have actually been requesting for me to deal with on a program for a while. And this issue recently came up. Um, with not just our synod, but but others as well, uh, and all three of us are from different synods, and we'll we'll talk about that. But um, because specifically of the COVID nineteen issue and congregations not being able to meet regularly, uh, a lot of questions came about related to the celebration of the Lord's Supper and can we have alternative ways of communing? And one of the options was to have communion online through streaming, through Zoom, or some other medium, and pretty universally, uh, the confessional Lutheran church bodies have released statements dealing with it. The CTCR of the Missouri Synod dealt with it. Um, the president of Lutheran Church Canada dealt with it. Uh, I saw statements from ELS, the Wisconsin Synod. I mean, pretty much everyone has, has spoken about this. But despite the fact that there's pretty much unanimity for the most part among confessional Lutherans on this issue, there are still some who are arguing for the validity of this practice of online communion. Uh, in particular, there was a, a document that was released by uh, Pastor Chris Rosebro in the AALC. In uh, this document, was titled "In Defense of Christian Assemblies Gathering on the Internet for the Purpose of Receiving the Sacrament of the Altar." Uh, and this paper was posted publicly, and so you can kind of look at his arguments. But uh, in response to that, I wrote a document, an article uh, in response, um, which both Pastor Fenn and Pastor Polzin helped me with, and that's a document that is just called a response to, and then the name of the document. I know it's a, it's a long title. Uh, you can find it on justincenter.org. So we've been thinking through and talking about this issue together for, for a little bit. And even before this, we've, we've talked about this. Um, and what we're gonna do on this program is not, we're not gonna just be responding point by point uh, to that particular document. That's something that you, know, you can look at there if you want. Um, we already did that. Yeah, we already did that. So we don't need to cover that ground again. But what I do want to do is just have a conversation about some of the practical implications of this, um, some things that are going on in the Lutheran world, answering some questions that people may have about this topic. So I'd like to hear from you guys, uh, because you're both in different church bodies. So maybe this is a good way to start is what's been going on with your church body in terms of this question? Has this been an issue for you guys? Yes. Can you yes. say any more? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's been an issue. There have been, um, it was about um, April, end of April last year, and churches had been shut down. Now, I, I mean, to be honest, my church never shut down. We cooperated with the government. We did um, no more, we did services for more, no more than 10 people. We did over 100 services between uh, March 23rd, I think, and June 14th, <clears throat> and um, just to get all, you know, all my people there as yeah. often as they wanted to. Um, some churches decided to shut down. And uh, I, th I think it would not be out of line for me to say then the churches um, that had shut down and wanted to provide something more than just a service on a screen Right. Um, were churches that have more of a, um, I, I, I don't want to say the word contemporary impact, uh, because that's, it's not really what, what they do. It, it's more of a, um, uh, I don't know, you guys know what I'm trying to say. Give me words. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be mean or anything. I just, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I'm trying to figure out the right way to describe them. 
I, I would say that churches that I witnessed have given up a strict adherence to the confessions yes. for the sake of trying to win people for Jesus. Um, and in and in this way, evangelism uh, is set against a confessional subscription. Yes. And what we what we know as the church is your evangelism is set because of your confessional subscription. So with these churches, that's who, that's who I noticed started doing this. Um, I mean, we had a streaming service too. We, we recorded one of the services right. and put it online. Um, but what they did is they wanted to take it off just the screen. They wanted to put it into people's homes. And the best way to do that is through some kind of tangible means. And well, what do you go, what's, what in the church is tangible? And the answer, of course, is the sacraments. Now, they can't just do baptisms willy nilly because, you know, that would just be silly to do a baptism over the screen. And I, it's like, it's like everybody I, knows that, right? But, but why? Yeah, I, this is something I've struggled with is this whole question is why not? Right, exactly. Because if you don't have to have a distribution with the actual hands of the pastor, if that can be replaced by you distributing it to yourself, why yeah, I, I think that that is a question that really has to be wrestled with because I, you know, I, I recognize, of course, that I've never heard anybody think who says that virtual baptism is OK, but right. I think we have to think through the implications of what we're saying about the supper. That's right. Yeah. And and they didn't. And so they, they knew that baptism wasn't an OK thing to do in the home. So they encouraged homes to take bread or wine or in some cases, um, encourage parishioners to pick up consecrated bread and wine at their churches uh, which would be re-consecrated uh, through the screen. Um, kind of like the, the practice of, you know, elders taking consecrated elements uh, to the shut-ins, which I'm also not in favor of. Um, but, you know, they, they would take that consecrated thing and then they would re-consecrate it essentially through the screen. So this started catching on. I even heard from one person, thank God, I can't leave my house, but I can still worship Jesus and get him in my mouth uh, watching my church online. And it's like, no, no, you can't. <laughs> um, and sure enough, you know, as, as we pastors had started to contemplate that, uh, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod's uh, Commission on Theology and Church Relations, the CTCR, uh, published their response. And to be genuinely honest, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on it because it really wasn't addressing everything that I was seeing just in my yeah, context. Right. And more, it came to the, the end result of, um, because it's putting doubt on what the sacrament is, we shouldn't do it as opposed to bringing out an exegetical argument or a confessional argument. And those things were in there. I'm not saying that they weren't, but it felt like the, the end result for the CTCR, and it's a good result, but it's just not the end all be all of the argument, it was just that if, you're, if it causes people to doubt what the sacrament is, then we need to stop doing it. Yeah, and I think that I think that is enough reason right there. But it I, is. But that is the reason why we've worked on this document. Um, and by the way, there are some other documents that are coming up by others who are working at, at getting some more um, in-depth confessional, exegetical, historical, even technological angles to this question as well, dealing with the question of what is what exactly is the internet? <laughs> because that actually matters a lot when we're it talking about ton. meeting yeah. on the internet. What does that mean? Are we actually meeting somewhere? Is the internet a place? What what is what is going on here? Um, yeah, I think you. When you bring up, you know, that, and I, and I know you're being generous here, but what you're really saying is there are Lutherans who, who are worshiping in a way that is more like non-denominational evangelicals and borrowing They're their evangelism tactics. Fun and, functionally not Lutheran. Right. And, and I think this is one of the, this is one of the areas where I think it becomes really clear, the principle of, of Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi of mm -hmm. St. Prosper of Aquitaine, right? That the, the way that we worship and what we believe are so much intertwined with each other it that if you're borrowing from what say the mega church next door is doing who they happen to be you know maybe they have a huge outreach or they have a lot of kids in their church and you want those things which of course that's great we want those things in our church but you say hey we're going to borrow their methods because it works well for them without really thinking through the theological implications th this is such a great example uh, talking about the lord's supper of how that has huge implications for how we practice because mm -hmm. for the non-denominational church like, why wouldn't you celebrate the Lord's Supper online? Because you're not, it, it's just a memorial meal. You're, you're mm -hmm. just kind of celebrating. You're remembering Jesus. Like, it makes sense in that context. Which it does is, make sense. Which is why it's not as controversial in that context. But notice 
in non-denominational churches, even though their theology would allow that with the Lord's Supper. What weren't they doing? They still weren't doing baptisms. On they weren't. They weren't. Yeah. And I think that's really important because you, you do have to think through the implications of that or the consistency. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what my thought process is with this whole question is if you allow Lord, the Lord's Supper online, what does that, what does that allowance make room for in the future? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that, and you, you know, the slippery slope arguments, you know, are often criticized. Of course, kind of where our culture is on sexuality issues um, and thinking through what everyone was saying in the 90s, we're kind of the slippery slope arguments seem to be exactly where we're at today. So I'm, I'm not convinced that the slippery slope arguments are, are invalid. Like they seem to, have, they're often right. So um, of course it's, it's conjecture too. So, you know, you, you don't always know where things are going to go in the future, but I do think that it's really key that we look at the implications of what we're doing and ask, what else could this mean? Because I think what ends up happening is that we're really redefining what the church is. Like this is much more than just an emergency situation what is the nature of the church? Is the church something that has to be eaten in person or is it not? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean for the church? Anyway, um, Matt, why don't you, uh, um, sorry, we've dominated this whole conversation. You're like sitting patiently there. So maybe you can, uh, yeah, what's what's going on with the LCC and, and what have you seen in this area? LCC is harder to get a pulse on because Canada is a gigantic country, right. um, second biggest in the world. And there's only about 300 parishes. So we are spread out. Um, You're still bigger than the AALC though. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, our CTCR didn't even feel the need to respond to it themselves. Um, what we had was um, at the beginning of this last year, about a year ago, um, President Teuscher sent out um, a list of thoughts and recommendations for this. And in that list, um, he said um, online communion is, is right out. Um, and then when the LC, when Missouri's CTCR came out um, with their um, uh, piece on it, that was forwarded with recommendation to all of us uh, because um, although we're in three different synods, uh, we're all in fellowship with Missouri. <laughs> so, um, right. And, and us, us a little bit more so because we're essentially a synod plant of, from Missouri. Right. right. Um, so um, I've not heard of any churches in my district, um, not district region. We changed the name uh, region um, doing that. I have heard whispers and rumors and, you know, those kinds of things. Um of churches close uh, more out west doing that um uh but i i've not heard of anything in particular uh, um my church uh to to compare the differences between L lewis and i uh L lewis how, how many um parishioners do you have on paper Oh, on paper? <laughs> on paper. We should. That's, that's never accurate. That's never accurate. <laughs> I would say we probably have about 35 parishioners. Okay. So we have, like, our, our, our average Sunday attendance, our regulars, is probably up upwards of 100-ish, give or take. Um, but uh, we, we closed down. Um, we're, we're in lockdown right now. We're, um, we're allowed to have services up to 10 people. Um, but um, we've decided to go with the, um, uh, what Bill Swirla called the, the Eucharistic fast um, to, to go without for a while um, until we can get a larger group together. Um, and so we're doing matins right now and, and until the government lets us, get together more but you haven't um, and you haven't been closed this whole time i mean you you've gone no again. no it's yeah, been yeah. off and on, off, on again off again yeah, yeah. um uh the only time it goes into like even when uh, we have a stay at home order even when we're locked down we're still allowed 15 percent of our church capacity which is still 45 people which so the only but right now we have a stay at home order which means 10 10 people. So um, as long as the stay at home order 
is in place. But as soon as we move from stay at home to lockdown, uh, we can open up and we can have 15% of our building's capacity, which is 45 people. Um, so, uh, but I, um, LCC has been quiet. I, I've not heard any pastors ca causing a ruckus about this. Um, if there, if there's any congregations, they're doing it, they're, they're doing it and they're not making a big deal about it. Um, a, a lot of, a lot of churches, a lot of our churches here in LCC have, um, have been following the government's recommendations as best they can um and that kind of thing um and um in terms of online communion I, I think it's really important that we we see how the uh, doing uh, sacraments online changes the nature of the entire of what we do um, it changes the nature of the ceremony of the actions we take. Um, and, the, and by doing that, I think it really draws into question the validity of, of having sacraments online. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean, it changes, I think the fundamental elements of, of what's going on. And since you're all talking about what your congregations uh, have done during this time, I guess I can give what, what we've done here. We uh, initially at the beginning of, of this, so I'm in New York and of course, New York is very strict, but um, Canada sounds a lot more strict. So make me feel better about being in New York. Um, you should never but... feel good about being in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lewis just wants me to move out to cheese land out there in Wisconsin. Um, That's the best. So <laughs> we shut down for a few months initially, and then after that point, opened back up with, with precautions, but, but we've been open since. So, mm -hmm. um, but thinking back through when we first looked into this, um, I know that everybody was looking at like, what did Luther say about pandemics? And uh, what did the, you know, the LCMS do during the, <clears throat> you know, the Spanish flu? And it's interesting that that Walther did say that, or not Walther at the time, but um, whoever the president was during the Spanish flu uh, of the Missouri Synod, which which I can't recall. Um, it wasn't Winnikin? Winnikin was too early, right? That's what I was thinking, but I thinking when I think Winnikin was before that. But anyway, I don't know. I don't have. I'm sorry. I don't have the president's. I don't know. I don't know my LCMS presidents like I do my U.S. ones. I don't know if that's a shame or not. But that's a shame. This is more important. This is what should be taught in schools. Who cares about the U.S. presidents? This is what you need to memorize. Um, I'm just kidding. So, um, but but it was a practice in the LCMS that at taught at for a time some of the churches were shut down, and what they were doing was encouraging just family worship, and in some ways. That I think, and Lewis, we've talked about this on a program before, because you, you made mention of this, like streaming is actually not a great thing that we're doing this. And, and the more I've thought about this, the more I, I tend to think that you're right. Because when you have, when your only option is you have family worship because you can't gather in a normal setting, you know the difference between what you're doing and what church is. Mm -hmm. And I do think that technology has blurred the line in some pretty significant ways that does model things because what what we don't want to do is say well you the church everything else about the church can be online just not communion like that's not true either right right and you can't, you can't do the kiss of peace that's you true know what kiss a piece <laughs> <laughs> um but even but it also raises the problem of um pastors generally um tailor their sermon prep to the needs and personalities of their own people. Mm -hmm. um, the proliferation of um, online services um, allows people to stay at home and say, you know what? I really like Pastor Smith yeah, at exactly. um, First Archibald uh, Lutheran Church um, because he's fluffy and nice and he's got a sock <laughs> puppet and he makes me, he gives me warm fuzzies and I don't like. Um, uh, I laugh because I've heard this before. <laughs> oh yeah, um, no, I've, I've heard this too. Specifically and, the sock puppet one. Yep, yeah, and I don't like pastor, I don't like um, my pastor because my pastor 
makes me feel guilty and I don't like that. I don't like feeling bad. Right. Um, and, 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 or my pastor, you know, couldn't, or he's, he is the worst orator. He just stands up there and reads and it puts me to sleep every single time. And, and so I, I don't like it. Um, so w- this kind of, it's it's like all of a sudden you have all these shepherds with all these sheep and all the sheep are now just running off to other shepherds yep. and you know uh this kind of thing um and, and i don't think it in the long term i don't think it's healthy um and well because so, the, the shepherd when you think about it when the pastor you know the he carries the rod and the staff right and yeah. during a streaming service there's no need for the rod because well, you have no idea who's attacking your sheep and you can't use the staff to pull the sheep out of danger because you've got no idea uh, what, what's going on. Or at, on top of that, you have no idea who's actually streaming your service. <laughs> um, so there, there is no, there's no pastoral care and there's no pastoral discipline when it comes to online quote unquote church. Um, there's only the show. Yeah, that's all it is. Yeah, and I think no, on the other hand, I mean, to, to to I mean, we live stream all our all our services, um, and we have, uh, and we're not going to stop after the pandemic. Mm-hmm. It was always on my. We're uh, stopping this week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the 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 argument in favor of doing it is is we use Zoom, mm-hmm. um, and so we have shut-ins who literally can't get out of their home right. who are able to pick up the phone and call into zoom and listen live to the service um uh, we have people who are too uh, are, are still too scared to go out um who at least uh they want to hear the word um and so um there, there are drawbacks, but, but there are advantages to using right, yeah. technology as well. Um, yeah. The word, if the word goes out, the word does get heard and it can do what God. Yeah. And, and it's different. I mean, and this is the, I think this makes the point in terms of, you know, there's geographical necessities that are in place. Canada is very different than Wisconsin is very different than New York. I mean, you know, Wisconsinites, we've been, um, basically uh, reversing our governor's orders through the courts um, because, you know, he's overstepped the constitutional bounds, or at least that's what the courts, you know, when they've agreed with those lawsuits Uh, and there are local restrictions in place, but, you know, our, our people were, we obey those to the best of our ability. Um, But the, now that the restrictions have been lifted um, and honestly, my, at-risk folk have all been vaccinated. Um, there's no reason for me to continue the live stream um, because, quite honestly, my live my live stream is not an evangelical. Like if I if I were winning people by the live stream, I might consider doing it. But but the live stream is not an evangelical tool. It, it's it's something that's you know as you were saying, Matt, uh, there to um, provide the word for people who otherwise can't get it. And I totally get that. And the reason why we're, we, I just announced it the other day, but we're stopping the live stream is because most of our people are back and those who aren't back should be back. So it actually, by stopping the live stream may encourage them to come back into the building, you know, um, to be back part of the church again, uh, as opposed to being this um, ephemera uh, that just finds its way online to whatever it is that we have. Um, so it, it allows me to actually be their pastor again and not just the performer. Yeah, I mean, with, with any technologies, I think we're going to, there's inevitably going to be good and bad, right? There are going to be things that Always. can be, be used for good, for good and ill. Um, it, and I think the, the issue that I've had with the way that churches have used a lot of the technology is not that they're using it at all, but is that it seems like people are using it very uncritically or not thinking through the implications of what this could mean. And it just seems like people just so jump on, well, this is what we're doing now. And this is what everybody does now. And I think what we've, this is my concern is what we've seen in, in the Western world, even in the last hundred years is the fracturing of the local congregation in so many ways. 
And that's largely due to technology. And this is the fracturing of local communities in general, but the church you know, sees this profoundly as well. Uh, part of it's like the invention of the car, right? Like you don't like your, you don't like your local Lutheran pastor and the town 20 minutes away is a better Lutheran pastor. So you can leave your local community and go there to escape your problems. Um, and especially with the kind of consumeristic culture we have in the West right now, it's very easy to fall into that mindset. And then um, what, what I fear is people are so driven by their own internal desires that when the church becomes something you can just pick and choose from not just the options in your town, not just the options in your county, but the options from all over the world, because you can stream anywhere. It now becomes an instance, not of me being in a community where I, I'm just kind of stuck there to deal with those people and those problems in that pastor, which is good for us in terms of our formation and the formation of the community. We can now just escape and say, well, I'm going to find the place that gives into my desires or makes me feel good. And that can be, it, it can be in the sense of like, I go to a, you know, self-help, uh, you know, prosperity gospel service online, and it makes me feel good. Like the, the errors with that are really obvious and for anyone who has any knowledge of scripture at all. But even beyond that, those issues can be true even with people who are biblical in their preaching because you can fall into the kind of celebrity mentality of, I like this pastor. Uh, and, and, you know, I've spoken with, um, you know, college students this last year who, because of the restrictions at Cornell, they like can't go to any church unless there are less than 10 people, which is like an impossibility where they can get kicked out of school and all that. So um, a lot of them have they're just like streaming services online and they're like, well, I like this preacher. I think he's a good preacher and I'm going to listen to him. Uh, and it doesn't mean they're all terrible preachers, but now I'm concerned. What are you actually going to go back? You know, you've been doing this for a year, totally disconnected from your community. Are you really going to go back or not? And I fear that a lot of them aren't. And, and I think this is just going to have these long-term effects that we're going to be dealing with for longer than I want to be dealing with them. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's so much to talk about here. And obviously we're talking about- So now that we've hit the pandemic for 20 minutes. I know, right? <laughs> we've been talking about these big, these big important issues though, because this is all very much related to the subject of online community and is how it's being discussed right now. Tie it in first, Jordan, tie it in. Um, but it uh, <laughs> so let's get into the, some of the theological questions because these are really big practical implications and, and that's really key. Um, and if you want to see the theological stuff, read the paper, but uh, we're going to talk about it some here too. So one thing I think at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Matt, you wrote up something which I thought was very helpful. And I ask you to kind of talk about it a little bit, which is the question of the Lord's Supper in situations of necessity, because the, the struggle that everyone had, especially as Lutherans and like, we're all about the Lord's Supper. This is kind of central to our life of worship and our life with Christ and our theology. Um, it, this is like the reason we're not reformed, right? <laughs> Largely, it's because of this understanding of the Lord's Supper. So because of that, it becomes really hard to say, well, what if the church isn't meeting for a time? And so the question is, is it that we're like missing Christ? Are we without Christ? Is my faith going to like die out if I can't have the supper for, you know, two months or five months or whatever it is, you know, and it obviously depends on whatever the circumstance. We're not just talking about COVID, but just in any weird circumstance. Um, but, but you've done, um, I think some really helpful writing on this subject. So maybe if you could explain a little bit. Yeah. So I, I wrote this um, back Easter last year. Uh, so 2020. So this is like right in the midst of the yeah. beginning of the, of the pandemic. And this was just a newsletter to my congregation. Um, um, and um, a lot of people think that the defining feature um, of what it means to be church is, is to gather around Holy communion. And that is a, a, a very important part of what it is to mean to, to be part of the church and is to gather together. Um, uh, it doesn't feel quite complete if you can't gather together around the altar with right. your brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and th those, that's very important. Um, um, but what started me on this is just inside the back, inside the front cover of our Lutheran service book, there's that little prayer 
Um, send your Holy Spirit that having with my mouth received the Holy Sacrament, I may by faith obtain and eternally enjoy your divine grace, forgiveness of sins, unity with Christ and life eternal. So um, we've always made a difference, a distinction between physical eating and the reception of the benefits. And, and um, that's, that's very important to see because once you understand that distinction, um, the um, you'll uh, we we will understand that it is not the physical eating of the bread that forgives my sins, but as the confessions say, it's the spiritual eating. Now that doesn't mean, and that means by faith. Um, uh, and, and so the same Christ that is offered to you in the supper is also offered to you through the word. Um, that's why John 6, um, in that passage about the, the, the bread of life, when he starts off by talking about the bread of life, he says, he who comes to me will not uh, be hungry. He who believes in me will not never thirst. So coming to Christ and believing in him is eating of him. And that's... Um, a point that our confessions make that the true eating in John six, when Jesus says to eat my flesh and drink my blood, it's not, it's not um, speaking uh, primarily of um, chewing the bread and the wine and the Lord's supper. It's by Jesus own words saying that you have to come to him and trust in the promises that are offered to you. Um, and as Charles Krauth uh, puts it, um, the chief, one of the chief means whereby that happens is in the Lord's supper, but it's not the right. only, it's not the only means. And, and to be so, clear, you're not, you're not saying that people shouldn't or don't need to eat physically because that's, that's right. the invitation. You're right. ju I just want to make it clear for the people who are listening. Cause sometimes yeah, I think we, right. we can get hung up on the, the term spiritual eating right. because we've been so influenced by reformed thinking as to what that may or may not mean. Um, so when we're, when you're talking about the spiritual eating, it is in concert with the physical eating, but the spiritual eating is also done outside of the supper in terms of the reception by faith. Um, so within the supper, you've got the spiritual and the physical eating, but outside the supper, you've got the spiritual eating because that comes to you by faith. Yes. And this is not a Lutheran distinction. No. This is, this is part of straight up medieval Catholicism. You can find this in Thomas Aquinas, the Summa. Um, uh, it's right there. The difference between physical eating and spiritual eating and spiritual eating is eating with eating physically with faith. And, and I'm this, sure you could find it in the patristics as well. Th this comes from Augustine. I mean, Augustine makes yeah. this distinction when he's talking about John six. Yeah. And uh, th because there's a quote where we're that a lot of Calvinists used to try to say, Oh, well, Augustine didn't really believe in the presence of, the real bodily presence of Christ in the supper, which is just not true. But um, what, what they do is grab onto a statement about this where, where he says, speaking about John six, he says, believe and you have eaten, believe and you have drunk. And this is that spiritual eating. And I don't, I don't believe that a similar distinction exists in the East, but I could be wrong about that. But it is at least part of the entire Augustinian tradition that there is this distinction between receiving Christ in faith and the bodily reception of Christ that we have in the supper. If I, if I had to guess about the East, just based on knowledge of practice, I would say that this distinction does not exist. Yeah. That's my, that, that the physical eating is the spiritual eating in the East. Because it, because of the issue of the Lord's supper and, sh and young children. Correct. Um, because, and you know, there, there's a debate to be had about what age children should be partaking of the supper, certainly. But in the Western church, it generally has been later than in the Eastern church. I mean, in the East, it's you're baptized, chrismated, receive the supper, like it all happens at once. Right then, yeah. days old. Right, because if if you take John 6 to be only speaking about the supper, now I think there are implications of John 6 for the supper. I don't think that Absolutely. There, there's no connection there at all. I think it certainly is there. But But if it's only about, the supper, then we have to wrestle with that. Well, what does Jesus mean then when he says that unless you do this, you have no life in you? Well, if, if there is no spiritual eating, then you better be giving communion to infants as soon as possible or else they have no spiritual life. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be another eating.
that also is connected to just the reception yeah. of Christ. And and this is the reason, you know, when people come to the altar and cannot yet receive the supper, whether that's because they're children or because they are those who have not been fully catechized yet, um, I always bless them. And I say, the Lord bless and keep you as you prepare to receive his sacrament. The right. blessings found here today are yours. Um, and because it truly the idea is, it, and I want it in their heads, they are no less Christian for not having received the supper uh, than the person next to them who's received right. it there. Because the person who's received the supper, let's say a tablespoon of wine and a wafer, is no more Christian than the person who's, or no less Christian than the, person's who, the person who took the big wafer and gulps down the wine. So the, the supper in that sense, yes, Christ commands that we eat and drink, but there is more um, to the Christian faith in terms of what we receive from Christ than what we find in the supper. Yes. And what does our small catechism say? Our small, what are the benefits of the Lord's supper? Forgiveness of sins, life and salvation. Mm -hmm. what are, those are the benefits of the gospel. Yeah. That's why it's a means of grace. Mm -hmm. um, and so while it's true, you can't, there's no other way you can receive the body and blood of Jesus except for eating the bread and eating the wine or drinking the wine. You can receive the same forgiveness right. um, in any of the means of grace. And Pieper makes that abundantly clear in, mm -hmm. in uh, his dogmatics, that the, the, the grace and forgiveness offered in, every, in, in all of the means of grace are, are, is the same. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he overstates his case a tad, I think, but, um, the point, <laughs> the point is, is, is true. The same yeah. forgiveness, generally speaking, offered in the Lord's supper is also offered to you through the word, which right? is why Lutherans aren't going to make the distinction and say, well, you know, the absolution isn't a sacrament. If you want to make it a sacrament, if you want to call it a sacrament, call it a sacrament because it's all the word. Right. Um, whether it's the word in baptism, the word in the supper, the word in absolution, the word preached, the word read, all of that's the word. And so if you want to call it a sacrament, go for it, because it's got what's necessary, forgiveness, life, and salvation. Yeah, I mean, Luther speaks about Christ really as the ultimate sacrament. I mean, Christ is the, the mm -hmm. Holy One who gives himself to us. And these mm -hmm. are just the means that he does that. And right. it is through the word. And the word is also how Christ comes to us in the sacraments. Um, so these things are, they're all very much tied together. The, so the, the point of all of this discussion is to say that there may be times where there is an impossibility of taking communion yeah. that first of all, if you cannot take communion for whatever reason, if you're, you know, alone on a desert Island and die there, right. You never take communion. Like, are you now, is your faith gone? No. Um, because Christ still feeds you with it, with his word and mm -hmm. he feeds you in faith. So while it's not a desirable situation by any means, there's no such thing as an emergency communion like we have in baptism, mm -hmm. which means and that, go ahead. Oh, I was, I'm just going to say that that's the official policy of Lutheran Church Canada. Um, yeah. Our CTCR yeah. says there is no such thing as emergency communion. Yeah, and, and I, it's not the official policy of the LCMS, but it is in the CTCR document, I believe. Yeah, probably the same here then. Yep. And that's, that's just always been... The Lutheran position, mm -hmm. right? That's um, I say it is in a CTCR document uh, or a CDCR. Sorry, we're the C we have a CDCR, not a CTCR in the AAL. Get with the program, different. Jordan. We just have to be different because we don't we don't like being told we're just the small version of the Missouri Synod or something, <laughs> um, which I hear all the time. Or why don't you guys just merge with the Missouri Synod? You're like the same thing anyway. No, um, so we distinguish ourselves by using the term doctrine. And we've all got our issues. Yeah. Anyway, we are working on a document on the Lord's Supper that does mention the emergency communion issue as well. So that that will be part of our our documents from the CDCR as long as it gets um, officially published and approved and all that. Um, I, I I think that's what was also really helpful in, in these discussions um, is looking at the way the reformers, especially the confessors dealt with um, dealt with communion issues in their day. Yes. Uh, especially I'm thinking of uh, Martin Chemnitz, who, who's the author of the formula, one of the chief authors of the formula. Um, uh, and in his examination of the Council of Trent, massive document, right? Um, he's dealing with Rome and he's dealing and in his, there's some stuff in there which is really, really good. And he, he's dealing with the, this little phrase, 
that comes from, I think it comes from, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. It comes from Philip, um, which is outside of the use, there is no sacrament. Right. Um, mm-hmm. That means out, um, um, if you baptize a bell, it's not a baptism because it's right. outside the use, right? Uh, that's the traditional example. Um, uh, So outside of the use, you don't have a sacrament. And this was important for Rome because Rome had Corpus Christi possessions and you would consecrate the elements and put them, lock them up and and they were never consumed. So apart from the use that Jesus intended, you don't actually have the Lord's Supper. And so in the Council of Trent, they took the stand that, um, which I call the magic words stand, that uh, that you say the words, consecrates the elements in such a way that Jesus is connected to that bread, no matter what. Yes. Um, uh, and Chemnitz comes right out against that. And he taught and he, and um, he helpfully breaks down those words of institution to tell us what's in what's needed yes. in uh, a valid sacrament. And, and you can hear it every time, a pastor says the words, uh, he took bread, he gave thanks, he yes. gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. And they ate it, right? So you, you can just hear the words, you can hear the things that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take bread, bless it, say the words that Jesus said and give it to the, the people to eat. Um, and he says, with only the bread, which is taken, blessed with the word, given and distributed and received and eaten only that bread Chemnitz says is the body and blood of Christ. You know, I think that's, that's so key. And this is an issue that I've um, you know, I've, I've looked into quite a bit because part of our the CDCR statement that we've been working on um, deals with this issue of communion and reserve, because this has also come up with COVID because there are some pastors who have said, well, you know, we're going to, you know, maybe consecrate the sacrament, on Sunday and people throughout the week can come pick it up and deliver it. Right. So maybe, you know, next Saturday we can leave it here for a week and it's consecrated and someone else can take it. Um, And and I even heard of a couple instances of someone saying that they could do this for even months, months in advance and just have, well, we've just got the consecrated sacrament there. So they can just take it whenever they want. Um, People so dumb. uh, But, (laughs) but this is, I mean, this is explicitly dealt with by Chemnitz. This is explicitly dealt with by, by Melanchthon. Uh, it's explicitly dealt with even in our confessions in the formula of Concord, but examination, the examination of the Council of Trent expands upon this quite a bit more. But I mean, it's so clear that the act has to be a unified act for it to be the sacrament. And that, that is how all the Lutheran reformers explained this. And so while most Lutherans are going to recognize, of course, like, yeah, you, you, reserving the sacrament's bad. Like, the, the, this is hopefully what agreed upon Catholic? by most. I, I know, like, we've dealt with this issue. Come on. But... <laughs> But what you have with online communion is the same kind of divorce in the act. You don't have a divorce of time, but of space. Mm -hmm. And for Chemnitz, it has to be this unified act. And he he explains very explicitly. uh, And I've said this, like, guys, Chemnitz is is like the primary author of the article dealing with the Lord's Supper in the Formula of Concord. So if anybody can, you know, exegete that text properly, it's the guy who wrote the thing. Mm -hmm. And and we have so much extensive explanation from Chemnitz. And it's not even just in the examination, but that's probably the most extensive in what is needed for a proper sacrament. And he says that we need exactly, Matt, what you said, like distribution. Uh, You you need distribution from the, like, first of all, I can just kind of break down the, the summary of the argument here. Um, in in this paper, and I know there's a lot here, but but just to kind of summarize where we end up, um, I make the point that this the the all of the elements that Chemnitz outlines that need to be present in the sacrament are fundamentally altered by mm-hmm. online communion. The first is a Christian assembly, which is very clear. You have to have, and th- there's no grounds for saying that there can be an online Christian assembly. Like well, you, for, you have for to, instance, I mean, we're you uh, us three are recording a show for your podcast. We are not together. No, we are not. We are not gathered together. I mean, we're in two separate countries and within that, within one country, two very different states. We are, the only thing that we have in common is a particular web address that we click to get into a quote unquote meeting room, which is not a room. 
It is not a room. It is a electronic um, domain that does not exist in physical space. Yeah, it's not and like it a, barely exists in time. It, it's not like in a in a meeting room. What you don't have, it's not like there's some central computer that all of we're all connecting to. Like you can't even identify a, a, an electronic place like that. Right. We have various signals that are being transmitted to each other so that we can hear what the other person is saying, which fundamentally there's not really much any difference in terms of the audio that you hear from me than you would from a recording. Cause that's essentially what it is. It's a recording, but yep. it's a recording that you're receiving in real time. Like yep. there are all of these aspects of just what the internet is that have not even been discussed. And, and for this to be approved, you have to, you have to demonstrate that this is a valid assembly. This is a, a yeah. place. And this is one of the things we talked about is it's specifically in the formula of Concord, it's mentioned that we meet in places. Mm -hmm. Places, yep. <laughs> and I mean, and the problem is, is we use, we use um, physical language to describe internet stuff. Right. Because we don't have a language of the internet that exists outside of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to call, to call a chat room, a chat room, um, we use the word room again, not a room. Uh, even to call it uh, chat is not exactly what's going on in any of these things. Um, to call a, a meeting room a space or a place, you know, like join us online. You know, how many of us have said that, right? In our in our church stuff, that doesn't actually mean that you're joining us. It's just, it, we're, it's a physical language that we use because we don't have a particular language of the internet. I have no doubt that eventually that will develop and it may borrow from the physical language of English, but philosophically, we cannot treat that which is um, electronic the same way that we treat an in-person assembly. Right, it's right. very, very different. It's a very Gnostic move to do so. It is. Absolutely. And because it, it, it's, it's, um, yeah, it, it's a very philosophical move to say that a, an electronic virtual meeting is the same value as a physical meeting. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, there's lots of um, philosophical, theological, sociological, yeah. ecumenical implications to making such a move. Um, that, such, as, as it's been implied, some such a move will fundamentally change the church um, if it's embraced. Um, you know what I mean? It, it, it'll, um, the church then will, you know, could you imagine living in a world where there are no physical buildings anymore, just a studio in the pastor's house and everybody just connects via computer. Um, I mean, that is that really the vision that the new Testament gives us? Um, uh, and, and that, you know, that's, it's, it's hard to see how this, this works, but the other point, and then I, I made it earlier, I want to emphasize it again, is that the, Melanchthon in the Apology talks about how the a, a sacrament is a ceremony or a rite, a certain set of actions to which the promise of forgiveness has been attached by God himself. Right. Um, so it's not just word plus sacrament, e word plus element equals sacrament. That's true. But Melanchthon in the Apology flushes that out and says it's actually a certain ceremony. And what is the ceremony? The pastor in the stead and by the command of Christ takes bread, blesses it, hand, hand, distributes it, and the recipient eats it. Yes. And Melanchthon will say that when you do that, you have received the body and blood of Jesus. Yeah. And I think a couple of things that I want to add to that, those are like just really important insights. The, the first is like this conception of space is something that has to be teased out. Like you, you can't just say, oh, we're just doing online communities, just a given it's a, this is a space, this is a place, this is just what we're doing. You've got to defend that. Like you've got to defend that the internet is a place or that, that space is something fundamentally different than what we think of space to be. And it's not like this isn't an issue that theologians have, have 
discussed before. Uh, if you look at the work of somebody like Robert Jensen, he has this whole argument about what a place is. It's being present for somebody. And so he essentially argues that the, bod the, the bread in communion, the host, can be the body of Christ without Christ actually being there because of how he defines place. So um, my, my point isn't to say, I mean, obviously I disagree with Jensen's argument there, but, but my point is just to say that like, there are these other implications philosophically and metaphysically that are really key. In what that does, I think, to, to fundamentally alter what place is in this way, to say that I can be present with you, even if I'm not bodily present with you, well, what implications does that have for the supper? So why, why then does, like, why does Christ have to be present bodily with us if we don't have to be present bodily with each other in the church to commune? It, it, it seems to kind of, like, it, it takes the ground out from under the real presence of Christ in the supper. Because if I can be spiritually present to you, and this presence is as good as in-person presence, then why can't Christ be distant from me but somehow spiritually present to me. Well, this comes down to a, a big issue as well in that the, the church, whether you're talking the earliest church in, uh, you know, the house churches, even through to today, um, has been obsessed with the concepts of, of truth uh, and beauty. And we surround ourselves uh, in our churches with truth and beauty and it's a shared experience yes. um it's a didactic experience uh meaning a teaching experience that um you, you know like in our church we have beautiful stained glass windows that portray different uh things from the life of christ all the way from his um eternality um uh, from before creation uh even unto his reigning at the end and when you come into saint peter emmanuel you are surrounded by these things and you can dwell in these things and it's a shared experience and everyone's looking at the altar and you can see all of the, the symbols of the 12 apostles. And, and I mean, it's just, it's a beautiful um, thing to have in front of you. And it may not be to everybody's liking, but it, it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. And it's grounded in that physical sense. Yeah. Um, now you could argue, well, you can have a 360 camera in there. And while that's true, you cannot experience the, the church uh, that is designed in such a way um, as a group, you can still only experience it as a individual. And I think one of the best ways to demonstrate this um, is the, the loss of the movie theater through this pandemic. Yeah. Um, you know, I think of, uh, you know, like uh, Avengers, uh, you know, uh, spoiler alert, when Captain America sticks his arm out and, and Thor's hammer flies into his arm and we go, finally, the, you know, the answer is there. He's, and the whole audience is like cheering and clapping and laughing and, and everybody. If, if that came out and you were at home, you'd just be like, cool. But the fact that everybody's there experiencing that together, it grounds it in this one beautiful, timeless place. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that's a movie theater and it's a movie, but it's the same thing for the church, uh, that in this assembly, we experience things as the church, not as individuals, whereas online, it can only be experienced individually. I have no idea what Matt's looking at right now, because <laughs> what is Matt looking at? <laughs> and, right now? <laughs> I don't know what he's looking at. He's probably looking out the window, but you know what I mean? Like, I can't see what Matt's seeing. Like if, if I noticed that somebody was kind of looking off to the side in church, I could look, you know. Are they, are they looking at the bird out the window? Are they, you know, looking at the kid throwing up on his, you know, whatever it is, there's, it's just, it's lost. It's just not there. Yeah. I think actually the, the movie theater is a really great example because I think this, this shows how, this is actually an example that I use in a, um, something that I'm writing right now, um, is that, uh, <laughs> so don't think I'm going to say you got it for me. <laughs> and if you don't give me credit, I'm going to sue you. Oh man. Oh boy. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give I'm you just kidding. credit. I, I knew, see. I knew in the future that you were going to talk about this. I, I wouldn't say, <laughs> I, would, I would never sue Jordan, but I think that that's a, actually the, but the theater is a really great example of just culturally where we've gone in yeah. terms of our understanding of community mm -hmm. is that like at one time you didn't go to a movie theater, you went to a play 
And guess what? It was only happening like a few times and you'd have to just all actually show up in person with your community. Mm -hmm. And then we had the theater and when the movie theater started, it was also a kind of communal activity. Mm -hmm. And then the television was invented. Well, what happened with the television? Well, now it's just the family that gathers together and you gather together as a smaller community, but it still is a family unit to watch things. Well, that's well, with cable. Go, go with but, radio first before TV. Yeah, that's true. Radio yeah. first and then TV, but you know where I'm going. So, yeah. um, but, but now then after everybody that, has it on their own individual exactly. devices. And now that's become, well, at first it was like, well, then TVs are cheap enough that we can have TVs in different rooms and you can watch something here and yeah. I can watch something here. And then it became- And you were, well, bound, you were bound by time. By time. And that's gone now too. So mm-hmm. now it's anytime I want, I can do anything I want by myself. I can just pull the thing in my pocket and watch it. Mm-hmm. That's been really harmful to our- I mean, this is why like uh, loneliness and depression rates are they're, they're skyrocketing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this, it, there are a lot of reasons for that, I think. And this isn't just due to the pandemic, but I, I think part of that, we can say that it is isolation and, and loneliness. Mm-hmm. And the last thing we want to do as a church is now fall into the same trap that the broader culture has. Mm-hmm. Like we, we actually have the opportunity to be the real place where people are. Like mm-hmm. we have the opportunity to be in a world of increasing loneliness we are the body of Christ and we, we actually offer you something in person mm-hmm. when no one else is doing it. Mm-hmm. Can, can I offer a, a, another example, which will not only show off my crazy nerdiness, um, but it, 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 it just, it's another example like the movie theater. Okay. I like role-playing games, like good old fashioned. Oh, I knew this was going to be, I knew it was going to be D and D as soon as you said, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but think about it. Okay. But think of any board game. It could be any board game. Think of a board game. All right. What are board games for? They're for physical people gathering around a table with Cheetos and Fizzy Pop playing a board game. Oh, but Fizzy you know, Pop you can so kind, down yes. you can download um you can download something now and you can play the board game online with your friends. Mm-hmm. Or alone. Sure, you can. Yeah. But it's not the same yep, no. thing. Yeah. You yeah, miss now you can play all of the social. Yeah, you can play against the computer too. Yeah, that's right. You know, but uh, there's the coming together mm-hmm. that that's that uh, around the activity, um, which is now missing. Yeah, I think um, even even when you had like earlier video games, like I remember, um, this is actually another example I used too. But um, when I was young, like I played Nintendo all the time. Right. I still like the Legend of Zelda franchise is my favorite of all time. I play video games. That's like what I want to play. But I remember when I when I was young, like the original Legend of Zelda, that game was like totally impossible to figure out in so many ways. There are all these little secrets. But I remember that being such like a communal thing because everyone was playing it. And mm-hmm. I remember going with my friends to school and they'd be like, I found this thing. Did you did you find this behind like this bush? You can burn this and find this staircase that leads you here. And uh And then like the friends would come over and you'd see what the other person is doing and you'd tell each other where to go and what to do. Even when things moved electronically to some degree, there was some sense of community. And then slowly, of course, that that fell apart. And and at this point, there's just there's nothing at all. Um, And and what we have is this kind of faux community, which is like online gaming. Well, we would do that, too. I mean, and, you know, in college, it was uh, Halo. We would turn on the four player. Oh, yeah. And four people would be playing it, but there would be 16 other people in that room and we'd all be watching and cheering and laughing. And, and then it came to computer games and you couldn't, um, it wasn't a good enough connection on on the campus at that time in in 2002 uh, to do like online stuff. So we would network our computers together in the common area uh, and play against each other. But it was always a gathering, Um, you know, even though we were kind of doing separate tasks, tasks, it was all together that we were doing it and sharing that experience. And now we can share the experience and not be together. Yeah. Uh, but again, you cannot share an experience individually. It does not work that way. No, no. Yeah, so this is, and now we've kind of gone off track of communion, but but I think that this is really important. It's related, is, it's, it, it it's, is. It's, the, it's actually the heart of what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Because if, if you cannot, if you if the internet uh, is not a place, and we pos- and we're positing that it is not, yes, then the entire discussion of the Lord's Supper online 
goes out the window. There's just no point to it because if, if the internet is not a place, then, then the rest of it is gone because the Lord's supper happens in a particular place. Yes. And without that, you're, you're done. People assume that the internet is a place again, because we borrow the language, but, but it has to be proven that the internet is a place. And if you can't do that, then you can't do communion online. And you've also, go ahead, Matt. And, and the other thing that you, um, when it comes to the Lord's supper, although the Lord's supper is indeed absolutely a grace gospel, not law, there is an imperative right in there and it's do this, right? Don't do anything else. Do this. And by saying do this, he means do this. He doesn't mean do something like as unto this, um, do something kind of sort of like this, do this. And Mm -hmm. that involves the pastor standing in the stead of Christ, taking bread, distributing it without the distribution. You do not have uh, the supper. Yeah. Um, and in, in an online communion, there is no distribution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the person's, the person's just picking it up and grabbing it. Right. Yeah. And I think if I could quickly, cause I know we've probably gone, I don't even know what the heck time we started, but I think it's been just over an hour at this point. Um, but as um, you know, as we go into, we're spending all this time talking about the first point, right? Which is that you need a Christian assembly. And essentially if that falls apart, the rest of it falls apart. Cause if you don't have, if this is not a place, it's not a Christian, it's not an assembly. It's not a Christian assembly. Therefore the whole thing falls apart. And again, as Matt, as you pointed out, this is all, the point of it is scriptural, right? Cause we're going back to Chemnitz and Melanchthon and the confessions, but they're just following what scripture says. They're trying to identify what is it that Jesus means when he says, do this, which, which well, it's just, I don't even text. know that they're asking, what does Jesus mean? He, they're asking, what does Jesus say? Well, exactly. Yeah. Just what, you know? what does he say? What is the do this? What is the, this? And, and so let me just read the other elements of this. There is um, the bread and wine need to be there, of course, but even that is not the bread and wine in an online service is not the bread and wine that is in an in-person communion service. And well, the bread and wine that's in your home for an online service is not the bread and wine that is in the church. Exactly. And, and that's a big issue. It's not on the altar. You've got, you've essentially gotten rid of the altar, right? Mm-hmm. You, I mean, there, there is no altar at this point. You've, you've totally thrown that out. Um, you, which is so central to Lutheran worship, of course, but if you can meet wherever the heck you want, I mean, why does anybody even have an altar? Why don't we just have the little like grape juice and bread, you know, in our seats, the, the, you know what I'm talking about? That the mega Those churches individual have. packets with yeah. the grape juice and the wafer but like, on top? At that point, why not? Why not? Because you've already gotten rid of the altar. Yeah. Um, but then you have the, the verba there, which identifies the bread and wine that's in front of you. And this, this point was- Take this. Yes. Yeah. And, and this is what I, I heard this from, from Eric Phillips in like an online discussion about this issue. And I was like, this is like, this is so obvious that- when Jesus says, this is my body, just grammatically, um, I cannot point to something, Lewis, that I see in your screen and call that this. Right. Like that, that, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I can say this. And if I mean this, I can be talking about anything that's in front of me. I can talk about my, you know, my, my coffee mug, my candle that I have here, my desk, like all of that, I can say this. But if something is spatially distant from me, it is that. Now I fundamentally change the entire meaning of Jesus's words. Now yeah, I've changed the meaning of the verb. And that's actually, that's one part of the document that I'm very proud of that I wrote. Because <laughs> when you're, when you're on there, the pastor has to say in terms of the verba, he has to take the bread and say, um, take and eat. This is my body. But yes. that bread that's on, in front of you is also your body. Because if he doesn't say that bread also is your body, yep. then it's, it's not, it's not his body. But if you do that, You've changed the the words of institution exactly. yep. and you have no business changing the words of institution. You can't say, take drink. This is uh, the cup of the new covenant, which is in my blood. And that cup that's in front of you is also the new covenant that's in my blood. Exactly. You can't do it. When you do that, you're changing, you're changing what, what it is, not only that Jesus said, but what Paul wrote down and said, Hey, this is kind of what we're, this is what we say essentially. Yep. Right. Um, and you're, you're making the probably the most outlandish innovation in the church that I've ever heard of. And I've heard of a lot 
but nobody has ever been bold enough to change the words of Jesus to, yep. to make online communion a reality. Yeah. That's what you and, have to do. Go ahead, Matt. Yep. Oh, I was, I, um, the way I was taught to preside at the supper and, and I don't know if you guys were taught the same way, but I was taught that at the words on the night when, when a night when Jesus Christ was, rejected, our Lord took bread. I, I what, what do I do at that very moment? I touch it. Yes. Right. E- yes. Even if I don't hold it up, I, I, I will touch the, I, I, I have the, I hold up the little pattern or I touch, mm-hmm. I touch the, 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 the bread, the, the celebrant's host and the uh, Kiborium took wine, touch the chalice, touch the tray of jiggers. Right. Yeah. I'm saying jiggers. Jiggers. <laughs> jiggers. Um, we call them uh, individual uh, cups in America. <laughs> yeah, I call them Jesus jiggers. You don't. You don't just use Tim Hortons cups there. No, th- though that'd probably get. That one probably would be too. a big evangelical push of it. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, so wine and wine and timbits. <laughs> wine and timbits. That's right. Coffee and timbits. The, the Canadian sacrament. <laughs> Um, oh, man. um, I once, okay. I, I once, when I was, um, uh, doing field work in seminary, mm-hmm. I was at a church and they had the individual cups and the guy grabbed two mm-hmm. and he came up and he, you know, I'm, I'm like, uh, the true blood of Christ shed for you. And he, you know, boom, uh, he, he needed, you know, one, one, one shot of Jesus is not enough. He needed two shots of Jesus for all the sins he committed that week that's that's i've never seen that before no i've never seen that either yeah um yeah the the so the point though is we actually part of the ceremony is we actually take the bread and why because we're at at, we're also indicating which bread we're intending well that's why you put your hand over it right they make the sign of the cross That's because right. you're, yeah. you're you're identifying this and, and yeah and that's and that is in essence while you're not touching every individual atom of what's there yeah you are putting it in a specific locale by making the sign of the cross yeah it's and you're not, not all bread suddenly becomes jesus body that's yeah, even, in the right. church even in the same it's, yeah right in the same building like you you have if you have bread you know set out for people to grab and eat with sandwiches after the service well we do so we have a food pantry we have a food pantry in our church and there's often bread that's about to expire or has just recently expired that they put out for the parishioners to take home it's out in the narthex when i when we do communion and we do it every sunday the bread that is in that narthex is not consecrated right. because it is in this location that the bread is placed and it is in this location that the wine is placed and so again it's not you know uh take and eat this is uh my body and the stuff that's out there you can't say that um now i mean you you i guess you could uh if that were a valid use of the scriptures but you cannot how dare you even think about trying to change the words of jesus and if you're going to do this that's what you must do you and, must and, change the, your, the words of Jesus. That, and um, I, I would suggest also that churches that put bread and wine up in the uh, choir loft um, uh, for, for, uh, are not consecrated because they're, not, no, on the, not. they're not. not on the altar where they should be. I have never Part heard of, of this practice to put something in the uh, choir I loft. Hadn't heard of I. It. I hadn't heard of it before, but apparently it's happened, but that wouldn't be consecrated either. No, No. I don't understand. I don't know who does that, but apparently, I mean, even when I was part of uh, the Lutheran church bodies that were a little bit more frou-frou and I mean, they would have like, they would have like, I think it was 12 distribution stations because it was a huge church. Yeah. 12, they were still all up at the altar. That's what I thought. And And then someone pastor would consecrate it and they would take them to the station. Right. So it's, and it's all distributed from the altar because guess where the extra wine for the common cup would be? at the altar yes. so you're running out you have a runner go back and you uh, you know they they bring it to you and then they go back yep um because the altar is that specific place that's been a set, that's been set aside specifically for that purpose i mean the altar yep. really in the lutheran church is there mainly for that purpose it is and you've gotten rid of the altar uh, yep. in this you've gotten rid of the altar which is one of the most distinctive aspects of lutheran theology and worship from mm-hmm. which is just patristic too but um 
I mean, that that's a fundamental altering of the worship of the church yeah. in a really profound way. No yeah. pun intended. Yeah. Yeah. Altering. Yeah. Right. Altering. Yeah. <laughs> but to bring, so, to bring both of these points together, um, the pastor on, doing online communion cannot take bread because he has no bread in front of him because yes. the internet's not a place. Right. He mm-hmm. cannot um, give it to the other person They ha- yes. because they're not there with him. They're somewhere and that's else. that's re- the reception of it. Yeah. The reception. So it, it, and those are the last two elements that we have here listed that, that are in the confessions and chemnitz. It's distribution and reception. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, he can't, and he can't speak the words over it because there's no bread in front of him. It's yeah. somewhere else. And anytime you sep and Chemnitz's point is anytime you separate the instit- the words of institution and the, the minister from the distribution, from yes. the reception and Chemnitz has in mind in time, but the same principle would also imply in space. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have the sacrament because it's not, you're not doing what Jesus told you to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Kenneth is very clear that we don't have freedom to innovate in the sacrament. Like do this. Yeah. He, it, Kenneth, which the text itself says that, but you know, the way that it's understood by, you know, the early Lutherans too, when they look at this is you do what Jesus commanded. And, and the, because the argument that's been thrown out is like, well, if you say people can't do this, you're holding on to the regulative principle of the reformed church. Mm -hmm. And, and, And that's just, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what the reformed regulative principle is, but it, it also is just, I mean, it's not like the, the Lutheran reformers said, Hey, worship is just a free for all. And as long as the Bible doesn't specifically say you can't do this, you know, you can't, you can't, doesn't say you can't have a smoke and light show and, you know, have the pastor like fly around with like ropes tied to him or something, you know, like, of course the Bible doesn't say that, but that's not that's not appropriate right. for worship. Like right. the Bible does give us guidelines of what we are to do in worship, and especially when it comes to the means of grace, we cannot mess with the means of grace or yeah. decide on ways we want to innovate on what Jesus gave us. And I think we also need to be very clear that th- this online communion discussion is very different um, than the pastor taking the elements out of the congregational space to the shut-ins who cannot be there to receive it. Um, because in that sense, the pa- what the pastor is doing is he's going as a representative of the loc- locative church yes. to a particular person and not taking previously consecrated elements, but taking elements, you know, bread, wine, he's taking the verba, he's taking the distribution, he's taking the reception, uh, He's, he's got all of these things with him as he goes and does this. That, so that's a very different discussion. You know, so someone's going to go, well, you know, you're breaking this then by, by visiting shut-ins and bringing it's them It's not the same. It's not the same thing no. because the pastor is located in front of a person or persons as the representative of the locative yes. church. And so you have in that, and if we confess that we believe in the communion of saints, then it must be true that the saints of all time and, and space are with the Christian and especially located, located in that supper at that time. And, and even, um, even those, there's a small minority of Lutherans uh, uh, in Missouri Synod, especially those associated with the Godestines crowd who, who practice reservation. Um, reservation. Yeah. Uh, and and they, they reserve the sacrament and then bring reserve sacrament to their sick ones. But when they do that, what do they say when they give the words of institution then? They say uh, the, this, something along the lines of this bread was consecrated at this specific altar, at this specific church, mm-hmm. and I have brought it here to you. And these words were spoken at that time and place, and now yeah. I repeat and, them in your yeah, hearing. Yeah, and exactly. And, and that's the thing is that they would have the verba still there, even if they are not... I, I don't think the reservists are, I don't think that's the best practice, honestly. Right. But, but I'm just, I, but I, I, at I, least, I, but they're treating all the elements as real and important according to the confessions, whether and or not. They're, and they're tying it to a specific location. Right. At a specific. And, and, and to be clear, Chemnitz does mention this practice because this is a practice in the early church as well. Yes. And, and he makes the point that if this is going to happen, it has to happen immediately. Like right. after the service, people take it. This is, right. and it's still understood as one unified act in that way. 
Yes. Be- because but what, it's not the for our day and age, it is not the best practice. Yeah, it's no. not. It's definitely not my preferred practice. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't think it is a great idea. Um, but I think that there well, are still have, guidelines around which it could be done in a way that is more faithful yeah. to and, and our understanding of the sacrament. We have and we maybe, have images of the pandemic that went through uh, Germany in I think it was the 1500s or early 1600s, and there the um, uh, the pastor would go with his his acolyte uh, and distribute the communion to the sick or shut in. Um, you know if they could not get to church, and I don't know how. I don't know what the rate of that, because they didn't write anything about this necessarily, but they would go and they would distribute the sacrament from the church They would, and they would reconsecrate it each time they visited a new place. Yeah. And the pastor would take a long spoon and dip it into the, the cup and, and give it to the person and, and give them the bread because, you know, the Lutherans would have it in both kind. Um, yep. You know, whereas, you know, maybe the, the Romans did something different. I'm not sure, but but at least we have those images of the last, you know, great pandemic uh, of, of the church in that way. Um, and it, what it really just does show you is that, again, they're locating it in and from a place. And my point earlier, if that, you have to prove this. And if you cannot prove that, the whole argument falls apart. Right. And, yeah. And when people are going to, uh, people, have have raised the objection well i'm in such a such a location and the pandemic is hit um, and there are no lutheran churches uh in in anywhere near me and, and so you're saying i have to go without the supper and the answer to that question has to be yes yes this is you have to go without the supper this is a t- you you do not need the supper to survive spiritually you need jesus and you need to trust his promises so read your word remember your baptism um uh, we can talk about on a later date the efficacy of online absolution um but uh you know, re- you can definitely read read the word, listen to the word, and re- remember your baptism. The Israelites didn't always have the temple with the sacrifices. Sometimes they had to spend time in exile. Um, God set up those that temple and those sacrifices, and and they kind of work sacramentally. Um, and, and yet, just because they're cut off from the temple and the sacrifices doesn't mean they're cut. They were cut off from God. And that's not even just distance. That's like like the temple is destroyed gone and and there's no way it's why jews today don't offer the sacrifices the temple is destroyed and it's not like you had the freedom to just make your home altars and do sacrifices there (laughs) and well and but they and they did and what did god do he judged them them. for it you know um i mean you know it was not a good thing when they set up a home altar (laughs) you know yeah Yeah. Uh, or a regional altar that was not that did not please god and so I, it, while that is not uh, prescriptive uh, in that there only must be one place in all of Christendom uh, to do this, it's certainly uh, descriptive in terms of what, what's proper and what's not. Yeah, 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 totally. Well, I know we've gone way over time, but um, this is a big subject. There's so much more we could talk about, too, related to this um, you know, Matt brings up online absolution. That's another issue that I have a problem with. I think, uh, I think that that could be discussed as well, maybe, um, because I think that, yeah, the internet's caused a lot of issues. And I think, let me just say this, because I can use myself as the bad example. Well, when I first got ordained, you know, I had people reach out to me for counseling online that I didn't know in person, premarital counseling and other things. And I was like, oh yeah, that's great. I would love to do that. Uh, and, and it didn't take me long to realize what a stupid decision I made because it was first of all, thinking way too highly of myself to think that I should be giving them spiritual care when it's like they have a pastor that God actually gave them. So it's probably partially arrogance on my part, but also just like, you don't know the person in person. So like, you can't, you can't give them the kind of advice you like, you don't see, you don't get people's, um, you know, even in premarital counseling, I saw this when I meet with people in person versus online, it's like, you don't see their, their body language in the same way. You don't sense things in the same way that there are problems that you would sense in person. 
and, and I think the same thing is true with, with absolution as well, is that like, this isn't a free for all. You can just sin and who cares if you have any real repentance or, or we'll take any accountability for what you've done. You just proclaim the absolution to anybody you feel like, and then you're good. Like, I, this is a huge problem, I think. And I've seen this more than once um, with people online where someone reaches out to a pastor they know online or like, give me absolution because they don't want to actually confront their pastor and have to deal with the sin issue that is really there in their congregation. Anyway, totally different issue, but I think that's important as well. Um, but thanks so much guys for taking the time to do this. No problem. Thanks for having us on. Yeah. Um, and everyone who's watching or listening, let us know what other thing you'd like us to have a round table discussion about. Cause this is fun. We can definitely do this in the future. I would say even if there's enough questions on, I mean, go read the document that we put out. Yeah, that's true. And if there's line. questions on that, it may be enough to warrant coming back and answering the questions. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Um, maybe in the future we can get Eric Phillips on with us too. Sure, we'll have four. It'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. Then we'll all just talk all over each other the whole time. Woo! But uh, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for watching and or listening, and we'll see you next time. God bless.